Okay, so everybody should have made it through the first lecture where we talked about the basics of biology and the science of biology and characteristics of life. So now we're going to jump into the chemistry side of the course. As a biology major, all of you will be taking some amount of chemistry. Might be a year, year and a half, two years, who knows. But what I want to do is help set a foundation for some of the basic chemistry that you need to understand for biology. I'm going to teach things probably a little different than your chemistry instructor. That's not to say I'm right and they're wrong, just a different approach. Whichever approach works for you is what you need to figure out, and that's what matters, making sure you understand the foundations. So if you get it the way the chemists teach you, don't relearn it the way I teach you. Just make sure you're comfortable with the basics of chemistry for this course, okay? Because we're going to be coming back to it throughout the semester. We're going to come back to it as we move into other courses, other biology courses. We're going to come back to the, some of the basic chemistry, all right? So this chapter is going to be about the basic nature of molecules and then the properties of water. So water is absolutely essential to all life on Earth. So we want to understand what is water, how does it work, why is it so important, and then we'll talk about issues with water as we go into other areas of the course and what happens if water quality changes. That becomes a huge, huge problem for most life on this planet if the quality of water or the nature of the water changes. All right, so let's start out with some basic concepts behind the nature of molecules and the chemistry side of the course. <clears throat> when we talk about anything, living or non-living, we're talking about matter. Matter is composed of atoms. These atoms are made up of these tiny little particles we call protons, neutrons, and electrons. So hopefully this diagram looks a little bit familiar. You got protons represented by the little p's, you got neutrons, the little n's, electrons, the little e's. Now when we look at any atom, that could be carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, etc. It's going to be made up of a combination of protons, neutrons, and then these electrons. So you guys hopefully all are familiar with that thing called the periodic table. It's in the back of our biology book. It's in every single chemistry book. That's something that we want to look at. And when we're talking about matter, we're talking about these, the atoms that make up matter we really want to focus on the electrons. So for us, our primary concern when we're talking about atoms, or we could call them elements, will be the number of electrons. And most importantly, how many electrons are sitting in what we call the outer shell. So in this example, there are two electrons in this outer shell. That's a problem. And as we move into the chemistry a little bit more, I'll explain why that's a problem and what that's going to cause to happen. All right, so elements. Elements are your basic substance of all matter. We know of 92 naturally occurring elements. There's more. Scientists are creating more. But there's 92 natural ones. It's good news for biology. We focus on only about six. We're going to drill it down and get into C, H, sorry about the writing, it's not easy with the mouse, O, N, P, S. Those are the six primary elements I want you guys to make sure you're comfortable with. And out of those six, absolutely these four, for sure, you're going to see them over and over and over. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and then you have phosphorus and sulfur. Those six make up pretty much the entire living organism, the vast majority of the living organism's body, certain combinations of those elements, especially C-H-O-N. So when we see the C, that re represents carbon. That's the atomic symbol. Above the atomic symbol in this example here is the atomic number. Carbon has a six for an atomic number. The atomic number represents how many protons carbon contains. So if we jump back here, remember protons are in the center of the atom. This one has four protons. So if we were talking about carbon, we would have to add 
two more protons. That's supposed to be a P there. And there's another proton because carbon has six protons according to its atomic number. Now the number on the bottom here is the atomic mass. So the atomic mass is actually a combination of protons plus neutrons. So we do a quick little bit of math here. If the combination is 12 protons and neutrons and carbon has six protons, that's my protons, how many neutrons does it have? All right, everybody should be able to fill in that blank. So if we jump back here, this picture would not be accurate for carbon because it only has five neutrons. So we'd have to stick a sixth neutron in the center there to create the actual carbon picture. So carbon is going to have six protons, six neutrons. We go, okay, well, what's this going to tell us? How much is sitting in the center of that element? Great. What about those electrons? Well, here's an easy thing. Once you know protons, you know electrons. Protons are positively charged structures. Neutrons are neutral charged structures. So I'm just going to use a circle for neutral. But the electrons, this is supposed to be electrons, the electrons are negatively charged structures. That's why they sit outside away from the center of that atom. So if you know protons, you know positives, you know negatives. So if I have six protons, that means I have six electrons. We write it with an E with a little slash above it. Six electrons in carbon. So coming back here, you go, oh, wait, there's only four electrons. This picture isn't accurate for carbon. We would need to add two more electrons. And notice I put them in the second shell here. The first shell can hold two. The other four of carbon go in the outer shell, the next shell. So now that gives it four in the outer shell. Still a problem. And I'll explain why in a second here. All right, so we got protons, neutrons, and electrons figured out. Make sure you can do this. Big hint if you need it. Make sure you can do this for carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Absolutely. If you understand how to do it for those, you can do it for any element on that periodic table and figure out protons, neutrons, and electrons. But again, for biology, our main concern is going to be the electrons. How many electrons does it have? And then how are those electrons positioned? So in the center of the element here, we call it the nucleus of the element, different than the nucleus of a cell. But the center of the element is where, again, all the protons and neutrons get clustered. Right in there. They get clustered in here. The electrons, with their negative charge, zoom around the outside. They go in what we call these orbitals. These are little regions or the kind of rings, if you want to call it that, that contain the electrons. Now, the orbitals work in a certain way. The first orbital can only hold up to two electrons. All right, that's it. There's two. Two of those in the first orbital. So if you look at this one, you've got one there and one there. So two in the first, two electrons, give it a little squiggle, in the first orbital. Okay, now if you still have extra electrons, it creates a second orbital. So the second orbital can hold up to eight. So it's going to have a max capacity of eight in the second orbital. Depending upon how many electrons are found in the element, you may or may not fill the second orbital. 
some cases, you might not even fill the first one. But the only thing that doesn't fill the first one will be hydrogen in our world for biology. But you look at carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, phosphate, etc. They fill the first one. They go to at least the second one. So in this example here, our second orbital has one, two, three, four, five, six electrons in the second orbital, but it can hold a maximum of eight. If by chance it had eight, it filled the first, it filled the second, and it still had room, it could actually go to a third orbital. And if it has them, it will go up to, it's supposed to be eight, sorry, I'm running out of space here, eight electrons in the third orbital. This element here doesn't need to worry about it. It doesn't have enough to fill the second orbital to then roll over to a third. So this element would stop right there and say, all right, I got two electrons in the first orbital. I have six electrons in the second orbital. That means I have two available spots. It's like having two empty seats in a classroom or two empty spaces in your bookshelf, however you want to think about this. There's room for two more electrons. That space is what drives bonds and causes elements to attach to each other. So what's, tr what's happening here, let me put a box in here where I can type. Um, what's happening is the elements are following a thing known as the octet rule. I'll bold this, make it a little bit bigger so it's easier for you guys to see it. Okay, octet rule. The goal of the octet rule is to fill the outer orbital. Can it get eight electrons in the second orbital here? Could it get two in the first, eight in the second, if it still has them, has extras and rolls over to a third, it's trying to max, maximize and fill that third. Again, that is the goal. That's how bonds form. And we'll be talking about bonding in a little bit here. So remember the electrons are what drive bonding. That's a big key thing to remember with the chemistry side of this information. So, all right. So now sometimes we have elements that come in a variety of forms and shapes and flavors, if you want to call it that. This is what we call an isotope. Elements with various forms, what changes between one form to the next is the number of neutrons. That's the key. So carbon. We have carbon-12. So we did that math. Six protons, six neutrons, six electrons. Carbon-13. Still has six protons, and every proton is balanced by an electron. So it's always six pros, six electrons, which are negative. But then that leaves seven neutrons. Carbon 14. Six protons, six electrons. Oh, do the math. 14 minus six, eight neutrons. So now I got eight neutrons. So this changes the form of carbon from carbon 12 to 13 to 14. So depending upon which carbon you're working with, you can use it for different things. It's present in different areas. There are different variations of carbon, or we call them isotopes of carbon. So the most practical use for this is, you know, we talk about radioactive isotopes. When an isotope decays and breaks down, it releases energy. So we can track it. <clears throat> and based on how much it's broken down and decayed, we can figure out how long it's been breaking down. It has a thing called a half-life. It takes so many years for the, the element to break in half, and then so many years to get reduced in half again and half again and so on. That's the half-life. Um, so Isotopes play a big role in that, especially the radioactive ones. We'll also see it used in medicine in some cases. All right, so click into the next link, and we'll start talking about chemical reactions and how these things start bonding together.